Hello, everyone. Welcome to this class on optimization. My name is Andrew Ning. I've been a professor here at Brigham Young University for about six and a half years. Uh, this class is going to cover a range of topics. We'll cover various fundamentals and get into some advanced optimization topics. We've got a new textbook, a colleague and I, I'm Professor Martins at the University of Michigan, have been working on together over the last few years. Excited to share that with you. I'll, I'll post a link here in a second, or you can go download this book. You should expect about, about three lectures a week, and they'll be about 20 to 30 minutes each. Uh, and these will all be available here on YouTube. In class, we'll do some more interactive work, reinforcing some of the things here. In addition to those lecture videos, occasionally I'll post a more tutorial-like video looking at um, software and things like that. And, and if you're registered in the class, make sure you're on our Slack channel so that you can ask questions as they come up. Uh, as, as you're watching these videos, so you can get uh, quicker answers to your questions. All right, I'm gonna share my screen real quick. So just give me one second. There we go. Okay, so um, I didn't actually print this on here, but the website for a class is at flow, it's a W, dot byu dot edu um, backslash me575. Okay, and that's where you can find the link to um, the text, homework, schedule, and so on, syllabus as well. All right, let's get started. Um, if you were in class, we did this exercise, but if not, this is something that's worth thinking about, uh, you should imagine what it would be like to do an optimization problem. How would you pose this? So for example, let's say you wanted to build a bridge. We've all tried this, but, uh, or perhaps you've tried this, you know, with a simple popsicle stick model, but say you wanted to build a real bridge, how would you specify this as an optimization problem? So pause for a couple minutes and, and just think about that, maybe write some things down. How could you formalize this problem? Okay, so here is a diagram of the design process that um, all of us are familiar with and you've used before. As you were thinking about the bridge, maybe you came up with some specifications, like I need to start here and end here. It's got to cross this chasm, if you will, or it's got to be able to carry this many, this much weight um, uh, and this kind of wind load or whatever. These are specifications. And then, you'd come up with maybe an initial design, something to start with, maybe a past bridge, um, something similar. You evaluate the performance. So you have to decide what you're evaluating for, but uh, maybe you want this to be the lightest bridge possible. So you evaluate how much does it weigh? Um, and you've probably got some other criteria, you know, does it meet this other criteria? And you decide, is this good? Maybe it's uh, too heavy or maybe it's, um, not strong enough in some areas. So you make some changes, right? You reevaluate and you keep doing this until you know, you're satisfied or you get tired of it or whatever. And then you say, here's my final design. This is a, again, a typical process. Um, it's a good process, but it's not an optimization process. So in optimization, we make a few changes. Uh, and this is shown here below. The blue specifically highlights what's new. So again, of course, we're gonna still start with specifications and we're still gonna have an initial design, but we need to first formulate an optimization problem. We haven't really defined that. That was something I asked you to try and we'll kind of fill in some of those details about what that looks like, but we need to pose this as an actual problem. Now the inside of the box looks much the same except for it happens automatically. So we're gonna define some, create some model and formulate it. We give this to the computer. It's gonna evaluate this objective that we define in any constraints and it's gonna check, is this optimal? Have we achieved our optimality criteria? If not, it's going to update these variables, design variables, gonna do this change automatically, reevaluate, and it's gonna continue much the same kind of process we did, only it's gonna automate that and it's gonna do it uh, a bunch of times, potentially thousands of times or more, until it has achieved some optimality criteria. Now we would think that at that point we're done, but in general, we're not, right? We're gonna look at it and we still have that same kind of check. Is this good? Okay. And the reason why this is important 
is that in fact, it usually isn't the first time we do it. So for example, we formulate this optimization problem and let's say we do it fairly simply. We say, okay, here's my bridge and I want to minimize the weight. That's gonna be my objective. And I say, here's a bunch of members. Here's my initial design. I want you to change the thickness of all these say truss members, okay? And the optimizer goes and it does that and it spits back and it says, here's what you should do. The thickness of every member should be zero. That's the optimal weight, it weighs zero. In fact, if it may even be negative, right? It may even let you give negative thickness, say it's got a negative weight. And you say, well, this design is useless. Okay, so the problem is not the optimization. The problem is how I formulated the problem. So I, maybe I started at a bad point. That's one option is I, I started from a, a initial design that's just way too far, it's just really bad. Um, you know, if you've used like, for example, Newton's method and numerical methods class, you know that sometimes if you give a really bad starting point, it may not converge. Similar thing here, but more commonly, our, we need to reformulate the problem. We didn't formulate a problem that uh, is gonna lead to a good engineering solution. The optimization did exactly what we asked it to do. It minimized the weight. So now we're gonna go back and say, okay, I want you to minimize the weight, but I need to add these constraints. I need, for example, I need the stress in the structure to not exceed my yield stress, right? I need to be able to carry this much weight, for example, okay? Or, and then it's gonna do that and it comes back with a new design and, you're, and, and it's, uh, it's too narrow. And you say, well, uh, okay, it technically carries the load, but I need to fit four lanes across this bridge. So it's not good enough. I need to add a new constraint. And I go back and I do this again. So you can see there's this iterative process. As we become more experienced, we think of some of these things beforehand. We think of more of them beforehand, right? We, we think about the proper constraints, but even experienced uh, optimization practitioners are gonna need to go through some iteration as well. So one takeaway here is that uh, this process, while totally automated, you know, there's this temptation to think that, well, the computer does all the work for me now, right? I just give it the problem. It does all this work, spit it out, I get my bridge. This is easy, um, or, or it does work for me. I don't, I don't need that much expertise. And in fact, the opposite is true. We're actually trying to get something that's harder, an optimal solution, not just a good enough, a good solution, but an optimal solution. This is gonna take more work and the computer is helping us out here, but it actually requires more expertise generally. I need more insight into what's happening. Maybe I need to, I need to know something more about optimization, certainly, but also about my domain, right? About say the physics of this bridge or whatever my problem is. I need to know why uh, this is happening and what's taking advantage or why it's being taken advantage of by the optimizer. So all the work is shifted, not from this part, but to this portion and this portion, right? Where we spend a lot more effort trying to really define this problem really well and iterating on that portion. The actual converging of that problem once we define it is handled for us by the optimizer. Okay, so that kind of highlights some of the differences maybe between the traditional procedure we're used to and the optimization procedure. Let's uh, step in a little bit to form in the optimization problem and talk about some of these elements in a bit more detail. First, one of the key things we need to define is what are called the design variables. These are the variables that the optimizer is gonna be allowed to change. There'll be other variables that we will call parameters. These do not change, they're fixed. For example, with the bridge, maybe the air density is fixed. The optimizer, we don't want it to optimize that. That won't make sense. We can't do much with that, but we want it to change these thicknesses. They would be design variables. In this little simple two-dimensional problem here, um, this is actually like the shape of a wing and B here, this is the span of the wing and C is the cord. So you could think of it as the two sides of this rectangle. I'm gonna give that to the optimizer as things I could change. A key thing here is that these must be independent design variables. So there are many ways I could describe the shape. I could also, uh, and that's what these other lines indicate, S is most commonly used in aerospace for area of a wing. So these are uh, constant area and this AR is an aspect ratio. So I could also define a wing by its area and aspect ratio or its area and its chord or any combination of these, but only two of them. Right? I can't say the design variables are the span and the chord and the area because now I've got a redundant variable and it's, it's not gonna make sense. So I've got to make sure that these are independent parameters, okay? So 
these are design variables. And, and of course, um, as the designer, it would be nice to have more, right? The more degrees of freedom I give the optimizer, the better potentially my solution could be because I've given it more things to work with. However, as a practice, we generally want to start simple, right? Because usually what happens if we give too many variables, it may be hard to satisfy and, and, and sort of that outer iteration that we just talked about. Uh, it may be harder for us to reason about what's happening. So um, as sort of a um, advice of starting, it's usually best to start simple. Start with a simple problem. Um, make sure it makes sense and you've kind of worked it out and then add more design variables and then kind of build it up in complexity. It's a good approach to uh, make sure that you know it doesn't get, uh, just like writing code, sometimes you wanna just write the whole thing, but it's better to write a piece, test it well and kind of build up from there. Another thing to be aware of is that as we add more design variables, we may have to rethink and we almost always do rethink some of those constraints and maybe even our objective. Right, so if I add more design variables to my bridge, maybe first I just have these thicknesses um, and I have some stress constraints, but maybe I start thinking about changing outer dimensions of the bridge and now I have to think about other constraints about what's nearby, how many lanes do I need to pass through here and you know, uh, <clears throat> maybe some buckling type of constraints and so on. I also, maybe I added variables on materials and now I can't just minimize the weight because that might be very misleading. It may pick a material that's very light, but very expensive. And so I have to go to a higher objective, like say cost, for example. So that's why, again, we give this advice to maybe start with a simpler problem, make sure you understand it well, then add variables and constraints layer on that complexity. Okay, uh, we've been talking about, uh, or, or say, sorry, another key element here is what's called the objective. And we've kind of mentioned this already but this is a very critical piece of defining the optimization problem. So for the bridge, we talked about maybe weight, cost, there could be many things. Maybe we want to uh, think about some environmental impact. Uh, maybe some people might say safety, although I would argue that's more of a constraint than an objective. Um, we need to think about what is it that we want to achieve with this bridge? Uh, this is actually, uh, difficult problem um, for optimization and a very critical one, because as you can imagine, the minimum weight bridge versus the uh, minimum cost bridge versus the minimum time to build bridge will probably look very different. And this is something you've probably experienced in your life, right? Uh, whether consciously or not, we may have some objective as we approach different stages in our life or different things. And depending on the objective, we pursue, we can get very different outcomes. So we really need to take care that we think about what's the proper objective. And it usually involves digging in a few higher layers. So uh, here's a simple example with that wing, right? So we were changing span and cord. And normally we will have much more than two variables, but with thir if there's only two variables, we could actually plot the objective contours. So that's what these, uh, lines are, these are contours of constant objectives. So in this case, uh, maybe it was a drag minimization. So if we followed one line, these would be lines of constant drag. This is just like an elevation map that you may have used. Um, if you were looking at say a, a topography of mountains and so on, these would be lines of constant elevation on a map. And when they were closer together, that would mean that the elevation was changing more rapidly, it was steep. Same thing happens here, right, as these lines of constant drag, for example, are close. That means it's a very steep change here. And in this case, is a minimum minimization problem. We're trying to find the minimum drag, and that ends up being here in the bottom of this valley, okay? Uh, in this class, we'll use the convention of minimization. That'll be our default. Uh, and you can see, uh, well, actually, before I say that, um, Minimization is what we'll use just by convention, but that doesn't mean that you can't maximize the problem. So if my optimizer by default wants to minimize, but I've got an objective that I want to maximize, how could I give that to the optimizer without changing the optimizer? Actually, a few ways to do it. Maybe take a second and think about that. Um, after you've thought about that, uh, the simplest method and probably the most recommended is just to negate, negate the objective. So let's say here again, this is a 1D function for simplicity. Say I wanted to maximize this function. 
instead of maximizing the function, I could minimize the negative of the function. And you can see that's gonna return the correct solution. Another thing you could do is to invert the function. So instead of maximizing f, you could minimize one over f. Um, but this form is generally preferable because doing one over f introduces the possibility of another divide by zero error. And it also changes scaling of the problem, which is something we'll talk about. So simply minimizing is usually best. Okay, so we wanna minimize this objective, but notice that this wing looks kind of ridiculous. This looks probably uh, not like any wing you've seen on an airplane. And uh, it's really, really long span with really small cords, just this huge sort of thin wing. And the problem is because we have no constraints. All we said was to minimize drag and the optimizer did that. And so it created a wing that said to get really long drag on our really long wings, kind of like you'd see with a soaring bird. This is why we have sailplanes or, or an eagle have long wings, except for this is taking it to an even bigger extreme. And the problem is, you know, structurally, this is this may fail. Right? We don't really know enough details about this problem, but in general, that's something that would be a concern as it becomes really long and skinny, that there's not enough structural strength, it's gonna break. There's gonna be too much stress or it may deflect too much. Okay, so the next key element we have to think about is, is constraints. There are two different uh, types of constraints, actually three, but uh, I'll talk about the other in a second, but these are the two main ones here. Uh, the third is a, a simpler one. And they're inequality constraints, inequality constraints. An inequality constraint we can always pose in this form. Whatever, uh, it, it's just a, a constraint that involves an, an, an inequality of some form. And we can always move everything to one side so that it looks like this, right? So for example, let's say I had a constraint that um, x1 squared plus x2 squared has to be greater than or equal to five. Well, if I wanna write it in this form, I could also write that as five minus x1 squared minus x2 squared is less than or equal to zero, right? You can see that's um, uh, exactly the same form. So this thing would be our g of x. Sorry, I don't know why I changed colors there. Okay, the other type is equality. That would just mean that there was an equal sign. So to give an example for a bridge, an inequality constraint may be that the stress has to be less than a yield stress or that the deflection can't exceed a certain amount um, or that the width of the structure can exceed a certain amount. Whereas an equality constraint might be that the width has to be exactly this value. Um, in engineering, we probably, most, uh, you know, it will depend on your, your field, but we generally use much more of these inequality constraints rather than equality. And even with equality, we can usually pose it as an inequality. Uh, so for example, with the wing, we could say that um, we want the lift to equal the weight, right? That's gonna balance the airplane. But we could also say that we want um, the lift to be greater than or equal to the weight. We could pose it as an inequality and the optimizer won't actually exceed it. It's gonna end up being inequality because having excess lift is not gonna be advantageous. It doesn't help uh, the design in any way. It's just gonna add more drag. That's a, a minor detail we'll kind of get into a little bit later, but um, the main thing to take away from here is that there are these two types and it just depends on whether there's inequality or inequality. And most of the time in engineering, we use many more of these. Okay, so uh, let's look at a picture of this, for example, again in 2D, just so we can visualize it. Here's some objective contours. Remember these blue, these blue lines here, these are constant uh, uh, objective. And the minimum, if there was no constraints, would actually be in the center here. So you could think of this, if it was a maximization problem as a mountain or minimization, let's say this was a valley. Okay, and we we're trying to get here to the bottom of this valley. But I have constraints and that's what these red lines are. These are inequality constraints, meaning this is where the constraint equals zero. And so all this shaded region says, this is the less than equals zero, you can't go on this side. So I've got this constraint that says, you can't go anywhere on this side. This constraint here that says, you can't go anywhere on this side of the line. And this constraint here that says, you can't go anywhere on this side of the line. So my optimizer is gonna try and get as close as it can to this middle here where it's the minimum while still satisfying this, these constraints. And that's where I end up at this point here. We, of, we often use the star notation to indicate the optimum. So X star indicates the X that is optimal. Okay, so you'll notice that there are two different classifications for these inequality constraints. An inequality constraint could be active, meaning 
it went right up to the boundary. I said it could be less than or equal to, and it went right up to where it's equal to it. So this one is active. This constraint, however, I said it has to be less than or equal to, and it didn't touch it, right? It didn't reach that bound. So we could we would call this one inactive. These are inactive constraints. It's less than the constraint. It didn't cross over. Um, in other words, if I was to delete these constraints, completely remove them from the problem and resolve it, I would get the same answer. That's not true for this active one. If I removed it and resolved it, this would jump over to here, right, to a different solution. Now you may ask yourself, well, if these were inactive, why do we include them? The problem is we don't know beforehand in general which ones are active or inactive. As I'm designing this, this uh, bridge, I want the stress in every little member, trust member of the structure not to fail. But I don't know which ones are critical or not. So I just say the stress everywhere can exceed my yield stress, right? Um, and then the optimizer will tell me at the end which ones were actually active or inactive. And that may be helpful information, right? To know what are the critical pieces of, of this design. But I don't know beforehand. So I give them all to the optimizer and it's gonna then try to find the best solution it can that still satisfies those constraints. And one key tip is that, uh, uh, especially beginners will often confuse objectives and constraints. One way to think about them, the difference is that the objective is something that you wanna maximize or minimize, okay? Now, sometimes people use constraints as objectives, but a constraint is something that you have a threshold, you want to pass the threshold, but going any further doesn't really help. So for example, at the bridge, sometimes people will say, well, I want the strongest bridge. And then you, but, but do you really, do you really want the strongest bridge, right? Because once you pass the threshold of where it's not gonna break, does adding more material actually help you? It doesn't, right? It's over-designed. So if you know the biggest load that you can possibly take and the bridge will now satisfy that, it will carry that load. Adding more material to carry bigger loads doesn't actually help, right? So probably it's a constraint, right? There may be problems where, you know, maybe this was a, a hypothetical thing. You're just trying to find what's the biggest I could possibly carry or maybe, um, but in general, those type, of, those type of parameters are actually constraints. So you have to think, the way, the way to think about it is, is there some threshold that if I cross, I'd be satisfied and going beyond that is actually not better. If so, then that's a constraint, not an objective. Okay, <clears throat> so let's go back to our wing problem. Remember we had <clears throat> this kind of silly solution here. Well, now we added a stress constraint. We wanted to make sure that the wing wasn't gonna break uh, with some load and so here's this constraint and you can see the design moved over. Of course, it's gonna have more drag. That's of course the trade-off, but we need that, right? That's, that's, that, it's feasible, it's not going to break. It's gonna be able to carry the loads that we need to during flight. And, and that's always the case with constraints, right? If it's an active constraint, we're giving something up in the objective. Sometimes we think of that as limiting, but that's actually freeing. The constraints are there to make it possible. They're able to help us find a solution that works. Without the constraints, we've got a solution that is useless to us. So by adding constraints, uh, we're not limiting the problem, we're actually making it so that we can find a useful problem. Okay, and there's some good life parallels with that as well, perhaps. All right, so let's put those pieces together. Here's how we would define this problem mathematically. We define a function f, this is a notation we'll use, f will be the objective function, okay? And we have constraints, g, we use g for inequality constraints, and in general, there could be many, right? So here we said there's one through ng, there could be many inequality constraints. Equality constraints, we use h as the notation for equality constraints, and there could be many of those too, okay? And the design variables we call X, and there are in general many design variables. One dimensional problems are not interesting. Almost always we're gonna have ton, a bunch of these, okay? This is the third type of constraint I didn't mention before because it's much simpler to deal with. These are called bound constraints. This is a lower bound, this is an upper bound. These, this means that um, these are directly on the design variable. So if I had a thickness of that trust member and I said the thickness had to be uh, bigger than zero and less than, 10 meters or whatever, I and mean, that's a ridiculous size, a meter, okay? Whatever it was, uh, these, these are um, constraints that are directly on the design variables. Whereas these constraints, say a constraint on the stress, um, that's not directly 
that's some nonlinear function of these design variables, right? I put in these thicknesses and did a bunch of calculations. So it's not a, a direct bound on the design variable. So again, I've got my objective. I minimize the objective. I change my design variables with constraints, bound constraints, inequality constraints, equality constraints. Now, in general, and we'll talk about differences where we dive into the details here, but in general, from the optimizer's point of view, this whole thing is a black box. From the optimizer's perspective, it is going to give you a set of design variables and say, how about this set of design variables? Here's a set of thicknesses I'm interested in. And it has no idea what's going on in this black box. This is your analysis, your physics module. This is your, you know, a whole bunch of code. You've got this big package. You know, maybe in this bridge case, you've got this CAD program and this finite element analysis or whatever that runs, and it spits out a bunch of stuff. It's going to spit out these weights and these stresses and these uh, widths and or you know, ge geometric constraints and all these things. It's going to spit out these F, Gs, and Hs, and the optimizer is going to look at that and say, okay, didn't satisfy this constraint, and this one is uh, worse than the last one I had or whatever, and it's going to iterate, and it's going to say, well, how about this X? And it's going to keep changing it. So your job, you know, is you define this physics module here, you give it to the optimizer and it's gonna iterate. It's gonna be changing X's automatically. So you've defined this module that's gonna take in an X, spit out an F, G and H and the optimizer doesn't know or doesn't care about what's going on inside there. It's just gonna query it by giving these X's and getting out results. So an analogy here, I sometimes like to think about um, optimization as climbing a mountain, right? That would be a maximization problem. It's maybe something more familiar. Climbing a mountain, but it's climbing a mountain that is pitch black. You cannot see a thing. You can't see anything except for the spot that you are standing on, okay? We'll come back to this analogy later, but imagine that's all you get. So you're at this point in the mountain. Uh, you can, let's say, assess your elevation, for example, or whatever, exactly at that spot, but nothing else. And, and, and that's all you get, it's a black box, okay? And we'll talk about uh, some, some, we'll build off that analogy a little bit later, but just kind of keep that in mind for now. All right, so this is kind of the big picture of optimization. Um, to wrap up, I'm gonna throw out a few classifications here and I'm only gonna give a big picture. Um, you can jump into the textbook some, for some more details. Okay, so here's the classification diagram. Again, I'm not gonna go through all of these, uh, but in the textbook, we talk about these in more detail and I encourage you to look at that. So for example, the formulation consists of design variables, objective and constraints, as we talked about. We also talked about constraints. Well, they could be constrained or unconstrained. The objective, we could have one or multiple objectives. We'll generally have one, um, but we'll talk about reasons why we may have multiple later. Usually if we have multiple, sometimes it's indication that we haven't really um, gone deep enough to think about what we actually want. So for example, with the bridge, we might say, well, I want this to be done on time and I want it to be light and I don't want it to, um, you know, uh, have too many manufacturing complications or whatever. Um, you might think of those as multiple objectives, but really you've got maybe some higher objective above that, which is I want it to have low cost, minimum cost, or maybe maximum return on investment or something. So there's some bigger objective that combines those things like the weight of the materials and the time to manufacture and so on. The design variables, we could classify them as continuous or discrete. Mixed would have some of both. Um, as we'll see, discrete problems are much harder to solve in general. So we generally try to avoid them early stages if we can and, and at least try to find a continuous version. Um, and, some, and we'll talk about ways we can deal with it, but most of the, most of the problems we'll try to keep continuous. Uh, and then there are various uh, characteristics of that objective function, those constraints, that F, G, and H, those functions that we're computing. We call them functions, right? And don't be confused that that means like something we can write down as X1 squared plus two. It may be like that, but in general, that function means a whole bunch of lines of code, right? Some big computer program. Um, there are various characteristics, things you should go look at, but I'm gonna highlight a few that are the most important ones for us. One is the smoothness, okay? So here's a picture of uh, two different types of functions, or three different types of functions in 1D. This first one is discontinuous, okay? This one is continuous, we would call this C0 continuous, which means the function is continuous, but the derivative is not. You can see there's kind of this cusp. So at that point, the derivative is not continuous. 
and then this one, uh, sorry, this is, yeah, this would be C1 continuous, meaning the first derivative is continuous. This is what we generally would prefer for an optimization, um, even for gradient free ones. We'll talk about both gradient based and gradient free, but in general, if a problem is smooth, it's a bit easier to navigate. Oftentimes we have problems that are discontinuous, not because the problem is really discontinuous, but just because of the way we've implemented it in the code. So as an optimization practitioner, we wanna think about that and say, can we eliminate that? Was this real? Um, there are not too many situations where the physics is truly discontinuous, often because of the way we've formulated it, we've introduced them. So sometimes it's worth rethinking what the actual physics are and devising something that's more continuous and makes it easier to navigate the search space. Uh, another sort of critical feature is the, mo the, mo uh, the modality of the space. Is it uh, multimodal? Meaning is there one minimum or are there many? And in general, we can't know this. In fact, except for some limiting cases, which are called convex, um, which will be rare for the problems we look at, we cannot guarantee that the minimum that we find is a global minimum. Not for any of them. Now, some of the methods we use are uh, tend to explore more, maybe more likely to find a global minimum, but we can never guarantee it. So this is what that means is that um, a local minimum is something that is minimum right around this region. This is the minimum nearby, but it's not the minimum if we were to search everywhere. Like this is the lowest point that we could possibly find. This is the global minimum. And like I said, in general, we won't know that we are at a global minimum. We'll just know that we found a local minimum. Um, so, uh, so there are some techniques uh, to get around this. Like I said, there are some algorithms that will do more exploration. And even with those that exploit, sometimes a way to get around it is just to start from multiple points. I would try multiple starting points. And if we keep tending to converge to a similar, to the same point, then we may have more confidence that we found the global minimum, although we haven't proved it. Finally, there are classifications. Those were classifications for our physics that we solved, the FG and H. This is ways to classify the algorithm that's gonna to try to solve your problem. And they are classified by things like uh, the order, meaning does it need the function? Does it need the function and derivatives? Does it need the function derivatives and second derivatives? Uh, what's the type of search? Does it trying to just search and find a local minimum as fast as possible? Or is it trying to explore a lot? So you might think about the mountain analogy. The local search might say, okay, I know where I'm at. I know what the slope is. I'm gonna just try and go up as fast as possible. Whereas the global one might be, we can't physically do this, but we can of course do this with an algorithm. I'm gonna just teleport myself at different points around the mountain. I'm gonna kind of do this search trying to explore more. That may be slower, but maybe it's more likely to find a global optimum, whereas this local is going to be perhaps faster, but maybe get stuck in a local minimum where I find this little false summit, if you will. Um, and there are various other characteristics. Again, I'm not going to go through them. I'd encourage you to look at the text if you want, but this is, this is a, a wrap up for today. Um, next time, I'm going to do some examples of actually implementing this in code. We'll start with kind of a hello world type of example, and then we'll start diving into details of how these algorithms actually work. So we'll see you next time. Have a good day.